Okay, thank you for joining us here on Facebook Live. My name is Rita O'Connell. I'm the national organizer with Code Pink's Divest from the War Machine campaign. And I am delighted this morning to be here with two um, uh, uh, exploding young activists on the scene these days. Um, they did an amazing action earlier this week in Missouri. We're so happy to have them here to chat with us a little bit today about why they parked a school bus in front of a Boeing facility in St. Charles and what they're going to do next. So let's start um, with introductions. We have, we're have we lucky to have two folks squeezed into one tiny screen here today. So tell us who you are and, and where you're coming to us from. Yeah, my name is Philip. I'm an activist from Austin, Texas. I first got involved with activism with like the Bernie Sanders campaign uh, way back in the day. Uh, since then, I've kind of moved more into like direct action and particularly like peace activism. Um, this is actually the first action of this kind that I've done, but hopefully it's the first of many. It's definitely something I'm interested in. Uh, my name's Ash. I'm 21 years old. I'm from Florida. Um, I got into the activist scene from Standing Rock, and uh, I went down to Sacred Water Camp after Standing Rock, and I met this lovely bus named Sophia, um, the same bus that we parked in front of the Boeing facility, um, and it's been an amazing venture since then. No kidding. So, so tell us when the action came about and, and what led you to decide that, that now was the time to target this facility. Well, the bus has been like given us life for at least three years now. Um, many different missions of those three years on um, this latest was uh, solely activism. Um, and we were on our way up to Minnesota to help uh, some people be of service. And the bus, unfortunately, started uh, um, breaking down on us. Um, there, was, uh, there was a bunch of white smoke, a thick exhaust coming out of our exhaust and inside the bus. So we were like, OK, well, we have to get this fixed. We have to see what's going on. So we took it to a mechanic. And they said, after we spent all of our money there, they said, well, it's still messed up. Um, and you have internal engine problems. And it can blow on you at any moment and we we're like great that what <laughs> what do we do now um so we we're like okay where do we go and we were only about 120 miles away from st louis missouri where we have um a local hub there of um great great family a great activist uh scene there and we we're like okay let's just take it there and figure it out so we took it there we limped it all the way there and we stayed there for about I'd say like two weeks, two, three weeks trying to get like some organization on what we should do about this problem. Um, I had the genius idea on the way down to St. Louis to like, instead of just sell the bus and capitalize over it, um, to put her, put her down with a bang and go out right. Mm -hmm. And and, and boy, did you do that. The side of the bus, <laughs> yeah, and the side of the bus lane, now but... says, Boeing gains from Yemen's pain, which has yeah. made for some amazing photographs that have been flying around the internet the last couple of days. So this was first thing Monday morning, um, before yeah. before the crack of dawn there in Missouri. Um, why why this facility? Why Boeing and why now? Well, so we heard about the bombing of the school bus in Yemen, and so we were trying. We figured we're going to deploy the bus in some way. Just it's just a question of what are we going to do? And we heard about that bombing, and we decided like. That's what we want to do something about. And we knew the image would be powerful because this is a bus and we're going to park it there and leave it forever. It's gone from us. And so we figured that's going to be a powerful message. But unfortunately, you know, Lockheed Martin made the bomb, but there's no Lockheed Martin office in St. Louis. <laughs> so we looked up, okay, you know, there's other war contractors here. Who else is there? And the biggest one, of course, is Boeing. And we happened to find out almost through just chance through reading articles on the internet that that St. Charles facility is where they make JDAMs, which are joint direct attack munitions. It's basically a guidance package they put on a dumb bomb to turn it into a guided smart bomb. And they're selling those to Saudi Arabia. And so we were reading all about this and we were able to find out that facility we were, where we were at is the exact facility where they make those. So we thought that's the, there's only one way in a route kind of. So we figured that is the perfect place for us to put the bus and lock down and hopefully shut them down for at least a little bit. And it seems that you did. I know that they, they were open for business, but certainly they had to send their employees around to another entrance. And you got you had police presence in the streets and you had local news out. And so people, people paid attention. They knew you were there. And I'd like to read the statement Boeing put out. In the <laughs> well, yeah, it's, 
I, it, this is, I think, uh, this is an amazing thing that you that you um, coerced them into doing. Boeing said the following in response to this protest. Boeing supports U.S. government sales as requested by our customers, including development and procurement of new and existing weapons capabilities, supporting more than 35 global allies. And then they say this, which I think is the best part. Specific questions regarding international arms sales and operations should be directed to the U.S. government. Wow. That is absolutely shameful. I can't believe absolutely. that statement. What a dodge. I mean, I laughed, but in the bad way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I thought I thought they would do what all the cops there were saying to us, which was like, you know, the bomb they used in that school bus wasn't even made by Boeing. And I'm like, oh, geez, yeah, we spent hours researching this. We actually know what we're talking about. <laughs> so I thought Boeing would go that route of like, we didn't do anything. We're innocent. But no, it's amazing. Even... It's amazing how much it shows their complicity. They they know fully what they're doing. Yeah, I think it's totally shameful. They yeah. basically just said, yep, we sell weapons to lots of people. And if you have questions about it, talk to the government. I have to say, I think one of the best things about this action is that it wasn't Lockheed Martin, that you, you're drawing attention to the fact that we're doing this all over the country from all kinds of different facilities, from at least five major weapons contractors. Um, and that's just the big ones. You know, those are the ones that, that we know for sure exactly what kinds of bombs they're creating. And, and when you get into things like guidance systems and surveillance technology and everything else, I mean, we're, we're all over the world with this stuff. So the point is not at all, Lockheed did this, let's punish Lockheed. The point, as I think you are making really clearly, is let's take a look at this entire complex of, of US militarism globally. Now, you are not both specifically anti-war activists. You come out of, out of um, other, other activism realms as well. What, what brings you to this place and where do you see the intersections with the other justice work you've been doing? At least for me, I think that this was like learning about US foreign policy is one of the things that first got I mean, like really outraged and radicalized about like what's going on in the world and my personal role in that. Um, before this, it's been mostly like pipeline things like from Standing Rock up until now. But it's mainly because I didn't really know that there was other anti-war activism that was happening. Like it just seemed like that was kind of an old thing and maybe there's groups about it, but you know, I never heard about it. And so, you know, we thought, okay, whatever, I'm gonna do this action anyway. But now that I realize there is this much larger network of people doing things. I mean, I would say I am an anti-war activist now. So before this I was, and I just didn't realize there was like stuff I could really be doing about it. But Bravo. First action of many, I hope. Mm -hmm. Well said, and, and what about you, Ash? Um, he hit that perfectly. Um, I'm more of, uh, I wanna to go to the root cause of the issues in, um, it's it's very impactful to go to like the like capitalism is the output of like like they're causing pipelines and they're causing all of these uh, things to destruct this earth um and that's just like they're causing that and i don't want to go to the effect i want to go to the root of it and kill the root i want to stop the root and take it out of the soil so it doesn't further spread and if we're capitalizing over death, that's like the ultimate capitalism. Yeah, in my absolutely. Mind. And you've it's both like done the intersection between like capitalism and imperialism is like there's these huge, I mean, massive corporations that literally make money off of killing people. Like the more intense wars are and the longer they go on, the better their share price does. The more money Boeing makes and Lockheed Martin. And it's like, and it's all made possible because of racism because, oh, these are just poor brown people in Yemen, so they're just not seen by the corporate media. They're just discounted. They don't qualify for human status. So for me, that's what motivates me is like anti-war activism is like the intersection of like all of these other issues. It's like the apex of capitalism, imperialism, racism, like it's all right there. It's beautifully articulated. And I know there will be a lot of folks in the anti-war movement who are delighted to see young people from other movements moving into this space and seeing that so clearly. I want to talk about how you didn't bring demands to Boeing. You, um, you didn't um, come with any specific um, set of expectations. You, you acted in solidarity with the victims in Yemen. And, and Philip, you said, to the people of Yemen, I'd like to say that we have heard your cries and that you are not alone. That is tremendously powerful stuff. And I know that it's been received 
by folks in Yemen. I saw um, uh, some Facebook screen grabs of people, people who saw you do this and who know now that, that they are not alone and that there are American citizens who are standing up against uh, what our government is doing there. And then, and then you go on to draw this amazing connection. The same corporate state that is responsible for your suffering in Yemen is responsible for our suffering from Flint to Ferguson to the bayous of Louisiana. Go, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's part of what we were doing is like, we're not going to go to Boeing and do like the usual activism thing of saying we're upset and we would like you to do this. And if you do this, then we'll leave. Because I think, you know, we think that's just futile, like they need to make money. This is capitalism. So instead, we wanted to act out of solidarity with our victims in Yemen and say like, look, Boeing, we're not talking to you. We're not addressing you. We want to motivate other people and other Americans to take bold and nonviolent action. And it's not just like a sort of a charitable solidarity, like people of Yemen, we're going to help you. And it's not just a self-interest, like we're being attacked by this corporate state, we must defend ourselves. It's a recognition that it's both. We are under, like the people of Yemen and the people of the United States share a common enemy in the United States government and its corporate backers. And so it's like, we should collaborate on this. It's not just solidarity. It's not just self-interest. It's like the higher fusion of those two things. And I hope that like more people come to recognize that like all of these struggles are related and it's, you know, we just have to stand, stand in solidarity with each other. If we came with a list of demands, they would just throw the paper away immediately because our demands in their eyes would be absurd. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> completely yeah. absurd. And it wasn't about that. It was about that we wanted the people to know that we feel for them and we are sorry. And we, this is all that we can do right now. And I wish we could do more. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry we can't do more, but this is all we have right now. It's yeah. tremendously inspiring stuff. Mm -hmm. The media attention has been like really great, like way more than we expected. But honestly, we have been like most impacted by the fact that people in Yemen have actually heard about this. For us, that's like more meaningful than all of the other media attention is knowing that they heard about this. And they sure. know, like, we're in this together. Now, I am glad to hear that you're getting some media attention um, here at Code Pink. We've been talking a lot about how there has been absolute abject silence uh, 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 on the subject of a lot of our foreign conflicts, but specifically Yemen. And it wasn't until this, this particular guided missile that you all are talking about was dropped on that school bus that we finally saw outlets like CNN actually giving some coverage um, to the, to not only to the existence of this ongoing conflict, which is the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, which we are, we are uh, funding at aggressive levels, but also um, specifically pointing out American military contractor presence. And they, they ran this amazing graphic that showed Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and the people creating these bombs and, and the places the bombs have landed. That was a game changer in terms of the way mainstream media in this country talks about our involvement in these foreign conflicts that we don't like to call wars. So who have you spoken to and what has the reception been? It's all been uh, like local media at this point. Surprisingly, one of the best articles that was local was written by like Fox 2 in St. Louis. They wrote a really good article and they quoted like the statement we wrote like verbatim, like the whole thing, including like the we share a common enemy with the US government. I was very surprised that they quoted that, but it's mostly been local St. Louis media, I think. I'm not sure if it's gotten a lot of like national publicity, but it's activism. So I guess the interview this morning with uh, Current Affairs. In oh, great. Netherlands, it, was, it was like a 10 minute interview, very brief, but that's probably been the biggest one. But of course, the corporate media is not going to want to talk about us. <laughs> I know that. Not, not yet anyway, but we'll see what we can do about that. <laughs> so what, what's next? Now you're in Missouri. You, well, actually, no, let's, let's back up a second. You were, were you both arrested? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And and how did that all go down? Um, as much as arrested could be. <laughs> okay. Um, I got bailed out for my personal safety. Um, I'm trans, so I didn't want to stay in a facility. Um, especially St. Charles, they're known for being very white supremacist and um, like racist. And I, I didn't want to put myself in harm's way, um, but he was the strongest one of us <laughs> for staying in there uh, for all of the time and uh, going on a hunger strike as well. 
Yeah, I mean, so because I didn't take bail, I was they held me for 24 hours, then released me. Um, I was on hunger strike while I was in jail. Um, it was, I guess it was all right. It was painful, literally, because it was just like a, the bed was just like a piece of metal. So I couldn't really sleep because I, mean, I couldn't get comfortable at all. They kept the lights on. I wasn't eating. And, but the whole time I was trying to think like I'm doing this to be experiencing the pain and suffering to a minuscule degree that the people of Yemen and our other victims are feeling and to know like this is what that must feel like for them. So I, I try to spend a lot of time meditating and like having it be like a spiritual experience for me of like I am feeling the same pain and the same hunger that they are feeling and I only went not even 48 hours without eating. And people over there are probably going weeks. I think it's nine million people are at risk of famine or dying from starvation. So that's, you know, what my suffering I think is, you know, absolutely minuscule. Well, it's a it's a fabulous display of nonviolent civil disobedience, and for that we thank you. And and um, from all of us here at Code Pink and and my colleagues in the anti-war movement who have been enthusiastically forwarding me information about this protest since Monday morning, um, congratulations and and thanks. And we all stand with you. So so now, what's next? Um, we're actually in uh, Louisiana right now. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, longer story behind it. Way longer story, nothing okay. to do with anti-war activism. Didn't take a bus. No, no. no. Um, the bus actually had six solar panels, and we had to unfortunately sell those to get another vehicle because um, I have a daughter, and we need uh, at least some sort of transportation or somewhere that we can stay other than outside because it's frowned upon to live on Earth out in nature right. yeah. um, with a kid. Um, so we bought a vehicle and we're, um, traveling in the vehicle now. Um, we went down to Louisiana and now we're on our way to Florida, um, because I'm going to get top surgery. Um, and then hopefully, um, we, I, I was born and raised in Florida. So of course the water crisis there is a major issue in my heart. Um, so that's on the forefront of my mind, but no set plans yet. Fabulous. And Philip, where are you heading? Yeah, we'll see. Not really Thanks. sure yet. I know that there's um, there are things happening in Massachusetts, like actions against Raytheon, because they have headquarters there. I would be interested in going there and maybe seeing what that's about. But not really sure yet. But uh, yeah, this is definitely a beginning, not an end. Well, if any of the folks in Boston are watching, I know that they are excited to connect with you. They've already reached out to me about it. So after this, um, Philip, I'll be sure to get you some contacts uh, if yes, you head to New England. Way. Great. Um, yeah, we'll probably be together. Okay. Unit. <laughs> Fabulous. Traveling together, seeing what comes next. Well, it's been a, a real pleasure to talk to you both. Um, I, I can't say enough about um, about how how um, remarkable it was that you just really just the, the couple of you showed up and, and pulled off this this fabulous stunt and I, I think it shows a bit of a sea change in the way um, not just the activist community but but everyone is starting to think about um, yeah. American militarism in the world and and the intersection of um, this with all of these other justice issues as you've discussed. So here at Code Pink, we're working on a Divest from the War Machine campaign. Um, if anyone watching is interested in learning about how you can personally divest your own complicity or that of your institutions or your communities, please email me, divest at codepink.org. We'd love to help you um, plug into that campaign and, and connect with these folks too, if you'd like to learn more about um, what their next actions might be. Briefly, I want to say you seem to be working with um, a group in Missouri Environmental Defense Fund who had Post Defense Coalition. Earth, Earth Defense Coalition, my apologies. Um, so, so I assume they can find those folks online as well who are continuing to do some great work there in Missouri. Spectrum is increasing oh. our starting internet speed to 200 megabit. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I also want to uh, like remind everyone, you, anybody that is seeing this or that will see this, that I like through my activism career so far, um, I always thought that I needed my ducks in the row to like do an action to get media, to get jail support, to get like like legal observers, to have all of this stuff in line before I do something. But that's not the point. We didn't do that with what we had. We had three people um, that put this on in a matter of four days. Is we got kicked out of the bus and they were like, okay, well, we can't, <laughs> we can't just leave it here, we gotta do it. And just to really 
look deep down inside and to figure out why you're doing this and see the injustice and just do something about it. No matter what it is, just do it. No matter what the consequence is, do it because you know it's right in your heart. That's a fabulous place to leave it. Thank you so much, Ash and Philip. We'll be in touch, I'm sure. Thanks for watching uh, online, codepink.org, to find out more about us and what we're up to. Have a beautiful day. We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us.